The Miyasawa family lived an ordinary life in an ordinary home in Satagaya, Japan. Mikio was a successful businessman who worked in the IT industry, and Yasuko was a dedicated homemaker, took care of their two children, Nina and Rei. Satagaya is a ward in the southwestern part of Tokyo. The area surrounding the Miyasawa family home is a peaceful and quiet residential neighborhood, with tree-lined streets and a mix of modern and traditional Japanese architecture. The family lived together in a simple two-story house. Inside, the home was cozy and modestly decorated. The first floor consisted of a living room, a dining room, and a kitchen. A small staircase led up to the second floor, which had three bedrooms and a bathroom. The Miyasawa family was known to be a tight-knit unit, with a loving bond that was enviable to many. But everything changed in the year 2000 when a terrible tragedy occurred inside her home. The details of what happened that day are still shrouded in mystery, but the impact on the family and the community would be felt for years to come. As the clock struck midnight, a dark and sinister presence descended upon the Miyasawa family home. The family was sound asleep, unaware of the terror that was about to be unleashed upon them. Suddenly, the peaceful silence of the house was shattered as the unknown intruder gained entry through the window. The intruder had likely climbed up a tree on the back porch and silently removed the screen from the window, which allowed him to enter the building from the second floor. All four members of the Miyasawa family 44-year-old Mikio Miyasawa, his 41-year-old wife Yasuko, and their two children, 8-year-old Nina and 6-year-old Rei, were all brutally murdered in her home on the same night. The killer showed no mercy, attacking them all with a steel pipe and then stabbing them multiple times with a kitchen knife. The youngest victim, 6-year-old Rei, was strangled to death upon the intruder witnessing him asleep in his bed. However, this attack wasn't carried out in silence, which caused the father Mikio to rush upstairs. As Mikio entered the room, the killer proceeded to slash at him, and despite putting up self-defense, he wasn't able to withstand the attack, but did injure the knife-wielding killer. As a result of a deep wound to Mikio's head, the tip of the killer's knife even broke off and got stuck inside his brain. As you might expect, both the daughter Nina and the mother Yasuko had woken up at this point. They likely encountered the killer in the midst of running down the stairs and were severely beaten. The killer, whose knife no longer was to use, grabbed a knife from the family's kitchen and proceeded to stab them both. Nina, who was just six years old at the time of the murders, sustained multiple skull fractures and other severe head injuries likely caused by the same blunt object used on her mother. She was also strangled with a cord, which was found wrapped tightly around her neck, causing her death. At the scene, the family's first aid box was discovered open, with bandages that had some of the daughter's blood on them. Yasuko and Nina apparently took the time to heal their wounds and potentially hide somewhere while the murderer retreated to find a knife. An entire family slain within a seemingly short time span. It's tragic to say the least, and the sheer brutality of the attacks on the Setagaya family is difficult to comprehend. The sheer senselessness of the crime has left many people struggling to come to terms with the tragedy. However, what's particularly strange about this case isn't necessarily the killings themselves. One day before the half-year anniversary of the alleged deaths, police revealed that the perpetrator likely stayed at the victim's home for about half a day after committing the crime. The murderer searched the Miyasawa's kitchen after the killings. He drank six bottles of the barley tea he found there and had four tiny containers of ice cream. At 1.18am he used the family's first floor computer to browse the internet 
and some accounts suggest he may even have taken a nap on their couch because he even took a shit in their toilet without flushing. Authorities were able to identify that he had eaten sesame seeds and beans before the killings. Mikio Miyasawa's computer was analyzed and it was revealed that it was connected to the internet at 1.18 a.m. the morning after the killings and again at approximately 10 a.m. around the time Yasuko's mother Haruko entered the house and discovered the murders. Haruko got suspicious when she was unable to contact her daughter. The killer had likely disconnected the phone line and because of this Haruko paid a visit to the residence but had no response when she rang the doorbell. The amount of physical evidence the killer left behind is staggering. According to Tokyo police, that evidence included the following articles of clothing, a grey bucket hat, a baseball shirt that was drenched in blood from at least one of the victims, that was also white with purple sleeves, one of only 130 sold in Japan, a cheap plaid scarf and a jacket. They even have the murderer's DNA and fingerprints, neither of which have yet turned up in the databases maintained by the Tokyo police. Officers have only ever been able to locate 12 owners, despite the fact they are aware that the sweater he left behind was only ever produced and sold 130 times. The killer's DNA was particularly interesting because he appeared to have European ancestry on his mother's side. Other DNA indicators pointed to a potential connection to either China or Korea. His footprints have revealed that his shoes were most likely created in Korea in a size that was never offered in Japan. The bum bag he left behind showed that his waist measured between 70 and 75 centimeters, leading them to conclude that he was slender. During the investigation into the Satagaya family murders, police found a bag belonging to the killer that contained sand from Nevada. This was considered a significant piece of evidence. It wouldn't be that far-fetched to suggest that the killer may have had a connection to or knowledge of that area. The killer's bag included evidence that leads us to the Edwards Air Force Base in the southwest of the US, close to Los Angeles. It would be reasonable to assume that someone who had undergone training at Edwards Air Force Base would subsequently be stationed at Yokoto Air Base, which is about 40 minutes to the west region of Satagaya. The motive for the family murder is still a mystery, and it seems almost impossible to puzzle it all together. The fact that he had spent time in the house for hours as if he had just moved in is strange, to say the least. And it's very creepy to think about the fact that the killer is very likely still alive and has perhaps even seen videos about himself on YouTube. You'd think that with so many police officers dedicated to solving the case, they'd have come further with the investigation. However, there has come forward a couple of theories mainly originating from the internet trying to make sense of the crime and figure out a possible motive. One of which focused on whether Mikio had been spotted disputing with skaters at the neighborhood park prior to his murder. The murderer may have been a frustrated skater, fed up with the neighbor's complaints about noise, and then took matters into his own hands. However, I personally have a difficult time imagining this being the case. It's not necessarily a valid reason to slay someone's entire family. But despite this, the killer's clothing did presumably match that of a skater. There have been reports that some locals in the Satagai neighborhood had seen and heard about incidents of tortured animals in the area prior to the Satagaya family murders. However, it is unclear if these reports are directly linked to the murders or if they're simply unrelated incidents. Some people believe that the killer may have been responsible for the animal abuse and that it was a precursor to the murders. But as far as we know, we might never find out. While the Satagaya family murders may never be solved, 
it is important to remember the victims and to continue the search for justice. For me personally, this is one of those cases where I really want to find out who the killer is just for curiosity's sake and obviously for for the sake of justice for the victims. But uh, I'm just so curious to know what he looks like for some reason. This is one of those cases where I'm like, damn, I wish it wasn't unsolved. But uh, the fact that it's unsolved also makes it far more interesting and mysterious. But nevertheless, thank you for watching this episode of Horror Vault.